Thank you. Uh, I'm already a little overwhelmed, um, particularly Dion by Angus's words. So um, one of the things I'm going to do tonight is say thank you a lot because um, you don't do something like this alone. There are um, some major contributors, including people in this room, who have raised the standard of what this would be if I'd tried to tackle it without them. So it's, um, um, it's very, very important to me. And, 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 and really highly amongst those is Angus Martin. Um, many of us know Angus, but Angus is a pretty special guy. Murray Little John is obviously the patron of Frogs Victoria, and Murray, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Murray's work and Angus's by association, um, but it's, it's no exaggeration to say that almost everything in this book is kind of the, the work that those guys did and their colleagues and their students did created the foundation for where we are today. So that's really important. And, and I, that was a surprise to you on, that was lovely. Um, and I'll, I'll thank Angus about that afterwards. And thank you all for coming out, including, um, you know, even people from Sydney down the back there, Macca, wonderful to have you here. Um, there are amongst us here live tonight, some of the people, and I'm gonna touch on this, who are making, who are literally the, 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 the line between extinction and keeping some of these species going. So, um, so let's keep that in mind as we go. Um, I'm really grateful for the opportunity. It's been a lot of work to get here, as, as Lynette said. It's all been work that's been done kind of after hours and early mornings and late nights and weekends and things. Um, do I just down button or something to? Maybe. Okay, let's see what happens. Yeah. Woohoo, yeah. works. Okay, um, and the other thing is I'm going to, I've learned heavily from other photographers tonight and I will try and acknowledge those where I can. So a lot of those will be photographs by Peter Robertson, um, by my co-author Mike Swan and others. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is, first of all, why a new book? Why did we set to, to writing this, this thing? Um, I want to talk, as, as we've said already, a little bit about what I what I call the golden era of frog research in Victoria, and that is the Murray Little John era and Murray's colleagues. So I'm going to, I'm going to document a little bit of that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the features of the book, so what you get for your money essentially, and then I'm going to do what I always do and use this as an excuse to talk about uh, why so many of our frogs are threatened, what are the things that are making them threatened, what are the things that are making that worse, and what we could and I would argue should do about that. <clears throat> So, why a new book? This is not the first book about Victorian frogs. There's this book, many of you will own it. If you don't try and track down a copy, they're not made anymore, but this is still a really valuable book. Um, and it's something that has stood me well through most of my career. But the reasons why we have, uh, we've done a new book is that the original Frogs of Victoria book, uh, Frog Watch, was, is now 30 something years old. So it's been around a while. In those intervening few decades, there have been new species discovered in the state. And I've got here uh, one of the species that I had a little bit of a role in first documenting. So this is Latoria phallax, a native frog that uh, didn't occur in Victoria until a couple of decades ago. This picture is the actual first one we documented. Um, Graham Gillespie and myself down in Clarinda, I think, was the suburb when we were working on growling grass frogs. Uh, so, but other new species, Burulong frogs, were discovered in the, the state since that first book was published. Uh, what until recently was Latoria dentata is now Latoria queritata, the screaming tree frog, Far East Gippsland. Um, and also uh, a, a exotic European newt species has been detected in Victoria and, uh, and we don't know a lot about that, uh, that animal and that invasive. We don't, we don't know whether it's been here a long time and it's just been sort of sleeping quietly in the shadows or whether it's a, a very recent introduction. Um, there has been significant advances in our knowledge of the biology, ecology and distribution of Victorian frogs. And again, some of the people in this room have had a really leading role in those advances. And very, very sadly, uh, in that Frog Watch book, those guys, uh, so Jean-Marc Hero, Murray Little John, Jerry Marantelli, started to talk in the early 90s about the fact that frogs seem to be in a little bit of strife, or at least some frog species were in a little bit of strife. Now, sadly, those initial fears turned out to be well-founded and things have got worse, in some cases a lot worse, and that's gonna form much of what I'm gonna talk about tonight. So my condition when I, so, so the, the, the history of how this book came about is that my co-author Mike Swan, um, who's, who's written a number of books on, um, on Australian reptiles and frogs, 
Uh, he'd approached me in years gone by about other books and I'd always declined and, and turned him down. On this occasion, he said, look, I've got a deal with Syro Publishing to produce a new Frogs of Victoria. Are you interested? And at that point I said, yeah, this one I'll, this one I'll get on board with, right? So, um, so I decided to do so. But my condition at the time was, I am going to ensure it's got a very heavy conservation focus because that's my work. It's what I do, it's what I've always done. Um, and it's important to me largely because, sorry, I'm standing right in front of that. It's, it's important to me largely because um, we're losing some of these frogs. And if we don't have strong voices, then some of these things won't be around for all that much longer. Um, Put your hand, Westy, if, if you can't hear me down the back, let me know. I know the acoustics down there can be a bit, a bit awful at times. So, so that's the reason why uh, I set to and agreed to write this book. Um, and, and what I want to do is talk about now the things that, the, the foundations of why, why we are, why we have the knowledge we have right now. And much of that belongs to Murray Little John. This is a photograph taken by Angus Martin. We're not 100% certain who this person is in the, 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 the middle background there, but this is a picture from the Borbor Plateau. It was taken in the 1960s, and back then, this area was thick with Borbor frogs. Um, and as Dion will attest, so Dion runs the program on Borbor frogs. It's a tough animal to work on, but it's a hell of a lot tougher animal to work on now than it was back then when you could go through this. I'm sure Dion would rather be walking through that than what he's got to walk through most of the time to find Borbor frogs. <clears throat> So I'm really conscious of the fact that I'm talking about a history here that is post-invasion, it's post-colonial. Now, when I was writing this book, I did contact two of my, um, two of my uh, indigenous friends and asked them to contribute and both kind of indicated that they would, but it, it just petered out and repeated reminders sort of didn't get me anywhere. So I, I'm really aware that I've written a white man's book here. Um, I, I'm, I'm highly conscious of that and I do, one of the things about this book is it's really imperfect in a whole lot of ways and some of which I'll touch on, but there are things there, having written it and having been able to catch my breath now, there are things now that I know that I would improve upon and that's one of those things that given enough time I would hope to, hope to kind of work into to future stuff. So it's a, a post-colonisation story here, but I want to talk about Murray Littlejohn for a minute. So um, in 1961 we had an American a visiting American biologist by the name of John Moore, and he published a checklist of Victorian frogs and it contained 14 species. A couple of years earlier, Murray Littlejohn had joined the Department of Zoology at the University of Melbourne, and he then began a sustained uh, period of intense research on frogs, um, and, and, that, uh, and that generates much of what we've got today. So, so early notable uh, collaborators and names that'll be familiar to many of you are people like, we, we've already mentioned Angus Martin, Graham Watson, and uh, Peter Rawlinson, who's no longer with us, but these are people who have contributed extensively to our knowledge of herpetofauna in this state. Now this, this picture of Murray's, we had, a, we had a real fight to get this picture included in the book. When I started to write this book, Angus Martin gave me a box of slides uh, and he said, Nick, these are photographs that I want you to have. And he said, they're photographs of the work that Murray and I did through the 1960s or, uh, and 1970s. And as I went through, and I'm gonna to touch on a couple of other momentous pictures that were in that box of slides. This is one of them. It was a picture of Murray. I really like it. Um, Murray really likes it. Angus really likes it. And I wanted to use it. And when I had the acknowledgement down here, I had Angus Martin as the photographer. And Angus said, no, no, it wasn't me. I didn't take that photo. I'm sure I didn't take that photo. So, okay, well, who did? And, and he said, no, I don't really remember. And so we asked it a little bit around and we said we couldn't kind of figure it out. And I said, well, look, it doesn't matter. It was so long ago. But the publisher said, we're not going to run the photograph unless you know who the photographer is. So it turns out, I, I learned a bit about copyright law in writing this book. And it turns out that, uh, that if I take my phone out now, and I should put that on silent while I think of it, and I hand that to Lynette and Lynette takes a photograph of me, despite the fact that it's my uh, phone and in the pictures of me, Lynette holds the copyright because she pressed the shutter. So whoever pressed the shutter on this photo owns copyright and we don't know who that is. Now, Syro Publishing wasn't going to run with this photo because they were really nervous about getting sued or whatever. And I said to them, look, it's, it's low risk. It was taken in the 1960s, I think. Um, the, the person may no longer be with us and they may not have remembered that they took the photo and so on. So we, we don't know. Um, the latest uh, 
the latest uh, suggestion I had from Tisha, and I think she's right, is that perhaps it was taken by Murray's wife who accompanied him on, on most of his field work. So there's a very, very good chance that, that Patsy Littlejohn, who's, who's no, also no longer with us, probably took this photograph. <clears throat> okay, so what did these people do? Um, over that period from, from about 1960 until well into the 21st century, they, in, in a couple of short years, their field work doubled the species list in the state from John Moore's uh, 1961 list. So we went from 14 species to 29 species in a couple of years. They worked on mail calls, and, and, and th these are dot points, right? The, you know, each one of these contains multiple um, highly regarded publications, internationally regarded publications, and I'm just throwing them out as dot points. So if you want to read up on this, there's a whole story behind each one. Male call and female response, a really, really important part of amphibian biology, um, how these things get themselves together, how they differentiate between species themselves and so on. They also looked at speciation, um, and, and this is a, an interest that Murray maintains to this day, and I'm fortunately still in contact with both Murray and Angus on a regular basis, and Murray's still very, very interested in the species question um, and how we define species. They were interested in historic zoogeography and I've got this map here um, and some of you who've seen Peter Robertson's excellent reptile book will see this map. I've included it as well. I, I've included it because I saw it in Peter's book and I thought it's a good idea. I don't have many original ideas. I steal most of them. Uh, so the story here is that um, a botanist by the name of Ralph Tate, who uh, was well known from the Horn Expedition, uh, he, he initially came up with this concept of zoogeographic regions for Australia. It was co-opted by Baldwin Spencer. Uh, so, so Ralph Tate was a botanist, Baldwin Spencer was a zoologist. He co-opted it for fauna and Murray, Little John and Peter Rawlinson and others co-opted it then for herpetofauna, for reptiles and frogs. And they started to, uh, to talk about the species in terms of whether they were Aryan, Bassian, uh, and the various subregions and so on. And it remains a really useful way of thinking about the frogs. So Aryan species are stuff that we might think about Mallee frogs and so on versus the cold adapted stuff in, in Southern Victoria and Eastern Victoria. Um, Murray has a very real interest and, and many students, including my good friend Mike Scroggy from, from the Arthur Ryler Institute, and Scroggs and I have worked together for many years. Scroggs PhD was looking partly at the hybrid zones of Geocrinia, but Murray and his team looked at hybrids of Latoria, Geocrinia, Limnodynastes, a whole bunch of genera and species. And again, that hybrid work is, it's world standard. It really is very, very well known around the world for, for hybrid zones. Um, they discovered new species uh, simply by going out and, and doing field work and finding things that we didn't know were in the state. Now, I've got a couple of really special photos right here. These are two of the slides that are in the box that Angus gave me. Um, at the top there is what until very, very recently was known as Mixifies balbus, the stuttering frog or southern barred frog. It's now Mixifies australis, I think is the new name that they, the taxonomists have given to it. As far as I know, this is the only photograph in existence of a Victorian specimen of this species. The photograph that is in the Frog Watch book of a mix of fish, Murray tells me, is a New South Wales animal. Um, so they didn't use this photo. So as far as I know, this is it. That, that's the only photo in existence of a Vic animal. Um, the one below is one of my very, very, very favourite frogs, and it's a program I'm running at, at uh, Zoos Victoria, the Southern Giant Burrowing Frog. Now, this frog was first known from Victoria when a, a specimen, a, a, a voucher specimen, a dead one, was displayed at the Field Naturalist Club in 1903. Um, for decades afterwards, there were no more records in Victoria, none. There was this one dead one at a meeting in Melbourne in 1903, and so a lot of people started to suggest that maybe it wasn't a Victorian species. And you know, specimens have a habit of kind of coming from all sorts of places, so... But then in 1965, uh, Murray and Angus were returning from a field trip just over the border in New South Wales, and they stopped their car, and they got out, and they heard some calling, and they tracked it down, and they found this very frog, and they could have, had they wanted to, they could have thrown that frog back over the border to New South Wales. They were that close to the border, but they were very definitely on the southern side of that border. So, so it was a very much a Victorian species. And so it was, it was confirmed then in 1965 as a Victorian species. Very soon after that, Angus and I think Peter Rawlinson did some work and found more at what's still considered close to their western limit around Walhalla. Um, 
And then since then, there have been a smattering of records over the years, but it's proven to be one of the most difficult frogs in the state to find. And we're now putting in a lot of work to, to find those and conserve them because they're a forest dwelling species. And like a couple of others, they're, they're um, affected by a whole range of threats, including fire, but also logging. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So very, very important species. Um, they describe new species, so they, 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 they did the taxonomic work on some of the species. They produce keys of frogs, of eggs, of tadpoles. So again, a lot of the, the, the seminal information that's gone into this book is from the hard work that they've done back then in those days. And they, they refined our understanding of species distributions and habitats. So because, and I'm an enormous advocate of this, we live in an age where it gets harder and harder and harder to get out and do field work, right? Agencies don't want to spend the money. They don't like the risk that comes with field work. They believe that you can do everything from a desktop and a computer model. Um, there, there, is, is, there is irreplaceable value in doing field work and, and one of the things that you do is you find things that you wouldn't have picked up on your desktop. So they, they, they got range extensions, they discovered new species in the state and so on. So for example, um, uh, Latoria citropa, uh, an East Gippsland, a beautiful East Gippsland frog, was one that those guys found in the state by doing the field work down there. <clears throat> Okay, now we had some beautiful words from this man earlier. Um, Angus has been um, an incredible support to me over the last few years of writing this book. Angus agreed um, to write the foreword and the foreword is as quirky as you would expect from Angus. I really like it, it's clever, it's a service, it's, it's wonderful. Um, Angus is a really good guy, he's a smart guy, he's a good thinker and he did a lot of hard yards um, including during some times when he, he had a few medical battles going on, uh, but he kicked my writing into shape and he, he set me on some paths that led me to, to permanently improved writing. So I learned some new skills that I stuck with, so I'm very, very grateful. Um, Angus also pointed me to literature that I wasn't aware of and really importantly to me, he told me the war stories. He told me the inside stories of what it was like being in the Little John lab and what they found. So I got I got an inside view that I hope I've reflected a little bit of in this book from Angus. Um, and, and Murray is also, and, and many of you will have experienced this, that Murray's very, very generous. If you ask Murray Little John a question, you can expect perhaps a week or two later to receive a letter in your envelope with a photocopy of his field notes from whenever in 1960, 1970, or whenever it was, that illustrates the point uh, that he's answered your question on. Um, so, so Angus has been a really, really great support during the writing of this book. And we need to remember that Angus, um, in and of himself, did some landmark research that um, is really, really important. And in a minute, I'm going to show a table of the what what was is known as the Limnodynastes dorsalis group. But Angus did the great work that allowed us to recognise subspecies of Limnodynastes gemerali in Victoria. Um, so. A lot of, again, a lot of the material in here has been compiled from the work that Angus has done. And these are some of the species down below that Angus worked on. And this is the paper that I, that I borrowed so heavily from in doing that sort of writing. Um, and there are other major contributors. We're really fortunate tonight to have Peter Robertson with us. Um, Pete is a, a force of nature when it comes to uh, reptiles and frogs in Victoria. Of course, he's well known for reptiles. Um, he's, he's literally written the book but Pete's knowledge of frogs is absolutely first rate. The other thing about uh, Pete is that he's a brilliant photographer and Pete had the forethought over many, many years to take the kinds of photos that I never would have thought of that turns out are very, very, very useful in a book like this. There are photographs of diagnostic features and comparative features that I've used heavily here um, that have made my life a hell of a lot easier. Um, one of the things about, I, I, I stuffed up with Pete's photos. I, I want to I mea culpa right here that um, uh, Pete put some really, really good work into um, scanning his slide photographs and I managed to stuff those up and use some that are a little bit underdeveloped. So I, I, I'm hoping one day to do a second edition or a second print run on this and mainly to fix the pics of Pete. So Pete, I'm, I, I remain sorry about that. Um, Pete's photos are much better than I've made them look here, trust me. Um, so here, is it going to work? Here's an example of what I'm talking about. So Peter takes photographs of things like the tubercles on the two Victorian Neobatricus species. So when you're trying to work out whether you've got a Neobatricus pictus or a Neobatricus sodelle, uh, these are the sort of features that are in the, the dichotomous keys in the book that you need to look at. And Pete was good enough over the years to take those kinds of photographs, to take the photographs of the two species side by side, to take the photographs of the baggy pants skin on the legs. So these are all features that Pete knew were important for diagnostics. Uh, 
Very few, if any, other people thought to photograph them. Pete did, and they've been enormously useful. And as I mentioned, uh, Pete has this book as well, and if you don't have it, I really highly recommend it. I use it pretty much daily. Um, it's, it's enormously useful, and it contains probably the best collection of information, well, not probably, it is the best collection of information you will get on Victorian reptiles in any one location. So do yourself a favor. Um, the other person I want to thank who also made a really significant contribution to Peter's book is Paul Gullen. Paul is a botanist. He runs a company called Viridans. Uh, Paul has written enormously useful ecosystem descriptions. Peter used them in his book, I've used them here. Um, and I, both Pete and I modified them slightly for our own purposes. But there are maps of eco, so, so this is box iron bark. This is a map of the box iron bark uh, distribution in Victoria. They are Paul Gullen's maps. Paul Gullen's words predominantly and a lot of the ecosystem photos are Paul's. So I'm, I'm enormously grateful for Paul for a, a really, really big contribution to this book. Um, and of course, I'm really fortunate in that I have um, relationships that I value more than almost anything with, um, with the most knowledgeable herpetologists in the state, in southeastern Australia, in Australia and further afield. And these are people who really know what they're talking about. These are people who've done a lot of hard yards to get the knowledge that they've got. And so when I wrote this, I wanted to make sure that for each species, that the people who know that species best checked over what I'd written or added bits that I'd missed or corrected or deleted or did whatever. And these are the kinds of people that did that. Uh, so of course, Murray and Angus, Dion Gilbert here who, who uh, works on bauble frogs. My very good mate, Dave Hunter, who many of you know or know of. Matt West, who's also here, who's done, doing enormous work on multiple Victorian threatened species. Um, Graham Watson, Peter Robertson, of course. Renee Cachulo, who has done so much work in, over the years on Euperolia, so Renee uh, was very kind in, in working through that. Growling grass frogs, everyone's had a crack at that, but Jeff Hurd, Mike Scroggy, Peter Robertson are the people who are kind of the final word on it. Uh, Craig Cleland on Shudofrini. Um, Craig, enormously grateful for your inputs on those, just to make sure that I was you know, not talking crap. Uh, and so on, down we go. So the idea was that, that where someone knew better than me, and that's, you know, for most species that's the case, I, I tapped them on the shoulder and they were all very generous with their knowledge. <clears throat> okay, so the book itself, what do you get for your 50 bucks or what was it, 20% off? I don't even know what the sums are, I'm too tired. Um, so here's what you get inside the book, right? So um, much of this is going to be kind of pretty standard fare for field guides. So we talk about classification, we go through the whole, you know, order, family, genus, species kind of thing so you know what's going on there. Um, I've already mentioned the zoo geographic regions that uh, Murray Little John and Peter Rawlinson uh, were so important in forming and the ecosystem descriptions and maps and photos by Paul Gullen. <coughs> um, I've got a chapter on the biology of frogs. So we go through, you know, um, how, to, how do frogs make more frogs or as Angus would keep reminding me, um, that maybe a frog is just a tadpole's way of making more tadpoles. So uh, <laughs> however you want to look at it, um, we cover all of that kind of stuff. Um, we look at you know where frogs live and, and how they breathe and how they how they uh, uh, um, how they live and uh, how they make babies and so on. Um, try to illustrate this as best we can with, with images of frogs' eggs um, and different developmental stages of eggs to tadpoles to metamorphs to frogs and so on. So. There's a lot of photographs in there and hopefully the, the pictures tell the story along with the words and make it really, really clear. Um, again, this is kind of pretty standard. Now, I, I, I would have liked to have had a fantastic artist uh, illustrate key features like, you know, tibial glands and, uh, and toe pads and that kind of thing, but we had no budget uh, to do that. So I've done, I've used photographs with arrows on them to kind of point out some of the key features. And a lot of those images with the key features are associated with these dichotomous keys so that uh, as, you, uh, as you look at the keys, you can refer to the photographs and sort of figure out what we're talking about. So particularly where we've used, necessarily used quite uh, technical knowledge, uh, excuse me, uh, technical terminology, um, we've, we've tried to illustrate that with photographs so that you kind of know what we're talking about. Um, we have descriptions of the, the genera and the families, and then for each species, we have the kind of stuff that you'd expect to have. So we have uh, synonyms, so other names that the species has been known by over time, so that if you're looking at older literature, you can kind of join the dots and figure out that we're talking about the same species. Um, 
Really, really importantly, obviously, is the ID stuff. So the ID section, we have, uh, and I've again used Peter's book as a lead on this, and, and put in bold text the key features that you need to be looking at for the, for the frog that you've got in your hand. Um, it's got, I've got a very, very brief egg and tadpole description. Now, there was a bit of a dilemma for me when I was writing this, when some people were saying, uh, look at this book that Marian Anstis has produced. Well, I have it on there because I can't lift it up, it's so big. But, but look at this book Marian Anstis has produced on uh, tadpoles of Australia. Uh, maybe you need to do this really detailed. And I just, th honestly, I just did not have the time or the fight left in me to do justice to tadpoles and eggs. So, it's, so, so my description of those is very, very brief and the focus really is on the frogs. Again, at some point in the future, I, I wouldn't mind regrouping and doing uh, a bit more detail on the eggs and tads because they're, they're obviously as important, um, they're, they're an important part of the story as the frogs themselves are. But so that, that's kind of quite brief. Um, similar species, so this is something that I think is really important. So it's not just uh, here are the features that tell you or that indicate what the frog is, but here are some that you might get confused with and how you tell those two apart. So I've put in a lot of effort in that similar species bit to try and try and help people out there. And a call description. So I've, uh, as a lot of frog uh, books do, I've given a, a, a verbal description of what I think the call sounds like. And a couple of times I was corrected. So Dave Hunter, um, corrected some of those and said, no, they don't sound like that, you're an idiot, they sound like this. And so I went with what Dave said, so we can blame him. Um, distribution and habitat, obviously, um, so all this stuff is, is we should be, will be no surprise. Photographs, and um, we've got photographs of uh, where there is quite a bit of variation between species. We've tried to include a few pickies to, to show that difference, some of the eggs and tadpoles and so on. Obviously, the biology of each individual species, um, which is, again is a very, very important bit, you know, trying to work out whether something is an aquatic breeder or a terrestrial breeder, whether it predominantly found in flowing water or still water, and so on. Um, and then, as I said, uh, so we've got a distribution map again, not surprisingly. Now, uh, just a, a comment on the distribution maps, they're really conservative. Okay, so again, Peter Robertson um, did me the great favour of working long and hard with me on these maps. And we, we use predominantly the, the records on the Victorian Biodiversity Atlas, but there's a lot of noise on, the, uh, 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 on those records and a lot of records that, particularly when we dug down into them and looked at the story behind the records, we were dubious about. So anytime I thought a record was maybe questionable, I didn't include it. So what that means is that if anything, the distribution map should be a bit of an underestimate of distribution. And already since the time I submitted the manuscript excuse me, to the publishers. A few things happened, some taxonomy happened that I, some I captured, some I couldn't because it was too late. But even our work in the Mallee in the last year or two, we've now got a little bit of a better idea, for example, of where um, Limnodonastes gemeruli variegatus occurs. So that map is definitely uh, an underestimate. They, they occur a bit more broadly. Um, and of course, the, the conservation and key threats. So I've dealt with the conservation stuff in a few ways. There's a table I'll look at in a second. Um, there is a chapter on conservation that I'll look at in a second, but for each species, there is species specific information about their conservation status. Now for some species, it's don't worry about them, they're doing fine. Crinia signifera, you know, we don't need a, we don't need a recovery program for crinia anytime soon. Um, for some, we really don't know. So there are species that we, we think we might be a bit worried about and others we think we probably aren't worried about, but we really can't say for sure either way on those. Um, and there are some that obviously we know are in serious trouble. And so I give very detailed information there on what is known about the reasons they're in trouble and again, what should be done about it. And a bit of the standard stuff at the back. So there's quite an extensive reference list and a glossary and that glossary was largely put together by Mike. Um, now I mentioned before about uh, one of, the things you, one of the nice things you can do when you write a book is to think about the stuff that would, I would find useful, stuff that I would want to see in a book. And so one of the things in there for me was the subspecies of Limnodonasti gemeruli. Um, so we have a map for each of the three uh, gemeruli subspecies. So you can look at the map and kind of figure out which subspecies you're most likely hearing or seeing based on the maps, but also um, through Angus Martin's good work in 1972, he published the definitive paper on this where he described the, the features that, that differentiate between the subspecies. But not just uh, Gemeruli, also Limnodonestes interioris, so um, a very closely related species and quite a similar species. So this table brings together all of Angus's information and it gives you a bit of an idea on uh, you know, where the distribution of the subspecies are and where they peter out. 
where one subspecies has a hybrid zone with either another subspecies or with interiorus. Um, and then some of the features you would use to try and differentiate between the two. So the idea here was that if you were in an area where you might be close to the border of uh, each of the subspecies, this should help you kind of tell what you're, what you're kind of looking at. Do you hear me right down there, Westy? Mm. Yeah, sorry, I know there's a bit of, um, I might try and come over here a bit. There's a bit of, bit of background noise here, I know what it's like. Um, so this is the part that was very dear to my heart. Um, I, I won't say the full story now while I'm being recorded about why the conservation chapter was a banned chapter, but um, buy me a drink afterwards and I'm happy to tell you the, the grubby story of what happened there. Um, the bottom line is that I, when, I, when I agreed to write this book, I had a, a paper, a manuscript that I'd been sitting on for some years and I worked on and I worked really hard on it um, after hours. And it was, a, a, I'd published a few years earlier a, a paper on the status of Victorian frogs um, and declines and what we should do about it. That paper upset a few people. Um, you're probably, in about five to ten minutes, you're going to see why they got upset. Um, and I don't really mind that they got upset. That was just, it was one of those things. But um, I had this matching one on frogs and that ultimately became, uh, it was something that was going to just collect dust and never see the light of day when I agreed to write this uh, book. Um, it found a home there as the conservation chapter. Now, really important, uh, oh no, I'm not up to that yet. Okay, so conservation of Victorian frogs. This is a, a term that um, many of you will have heard, the sixth extinction. So it recognises that over geological time, there have been five major extinction events in the history of life on this planet. Uh, there is a suggestion now, and there's a couple of books been written that suggest that we're entering the sixth of those extinction events there's some debate about whether it truly is yet a mass extinction event, but there's no debate about the trend we're on, right? So, so we know, um, and this is backed up very well with um, peer-reviewed literature, and this is what it kind of looks like. This is, this is why the terminology came up. So what we have here down the bottom is the background extinction rate. This is, you know, species don't last forever. We expect species to peter out over time. So this is sort of what the fossil record tells us uh, could and should be happening. What we see here since the Industrial Revolution is the kind of extinction rates that have people talking about this, about us entering a mass extinction event. So there's no question whatsoever that, um, you know, we're, we're making a real mess of life on this planet. Um, and that manifests itself today in this statement, which I find shocking every time I say it. I mean, we're talking about an entire vertebrate class in this state and 50% of the species of frogs in Victoria are on the list of threatened species. That should be a wake up call for everybody. And, you know, and I think for some of us it is, and, and probably I'm preaching to the choir on that, but this really matters. And so that was why I needed to take the focus I did in this book. I produced a table, this is just a small part of the table here. So for each species, I have listed down what its, uh, what its status is at a state level, what its status is at a national level in Australia in terms of its threat status. And then I've got a summary for each of those species. So you can very rapidly look at this table and get an idea of why a species is uh, listed as what it is. So hopefully that table's useful uh, to folks for various reasons. Now, a really important part of including, and part of that controversial paper that ultimately became the conservation chapter is I, you know, there's a lot of doom and gloom. I, I you know, my, my job has always been threatened species. That's what I work on. Um, you deal with daily eco grief and it, it can easily get into the doom and gloom. But I'm, uh, I'm a real advocate of saying that if we're going to talk about threats in the same breath, we should be talking about what the hell we should do about it. And that's what I do. It's what Dion does. It's what Matt West does. It's what we all do. Peter does it. Uh, all day, every day. It's not just about, yeah, here's what's going wrong. We're always advocating for what the hell we should be doing about that. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to touch very briefly on what I see as the major threats uh, to Victorian frogs, the reason that they're in the dire straits they're in. And I'm going to you know, practice what I preach and I'm going to talk about the things that I see as what we uh, could or probably should be doing about it. I'm going to start with a really obvious one, disease, and I'm actually not going to say a whole lot about disease and the reason I'm not going to do that is because, you know, 
Every second Frog's Vic talk or so is about chytridiomycosis. It's about, you know, I think that probably most of us understand that um, frogs are declining and that one of the major uh, reasons for that is this fungal disease that's wiping them out. So I'm not going to say a lot about it. I'm going to say that uh, in terms of mitigation, it's really hard. It's, it, we, can, we can cure chytrid in the lab. Uh, at the zoo, the, the zookeepers at Melbourne Zoo do such a, a wonderful job with the species that we're working on. Uh, they can deal with that, they can, they can use chemicals and they can use heat and other things to knock off chytrid. But trying to do that in the wild is a hell of a lot harder. There are some promising leads on that. Uh, things like, uh, like uh, manipulating water temperatures, shading, there's, there's even talk about um, cutting down the tops of trees to allow more sunlight into certain areas so the frogs can behaviourally warm themselves up and shake off the fungus. Um, things like salinity uh, and water permanence are things that we can manipulate at least on a small scale. But really importantly, I, I dichotomise threats to frogs and, a whole bunch, and other threatened species. One, one of the ways you can dichotomise it is to talk about the big nasty threats that even if someone gave me $100 million tomorrow, we can't kind of go and cure straight away. So chytridiomycosis is a very, very difficult one. Climate change, it's a global problem, right? I can't go fix that. We, I can do my, I can play my part and I, and I hopefully do, but, but there are a whole bunch of other threats that are absolutely preventable. And I am arguing here, and I always have argued that if we're gonna have, if our frog species are gonna cope with those big, big wicked threats that we can't deal with, we need to do everything we can to take our foot off their throat on these sort of preventable threats. And I'm gonna talk a bit about that. Um, and also some research here, so Tom Burns, you can see uh, uh, Dion was a co-author on this paper, as was I. Tom Burns was a PhD student at Deakin Uni that I co-supervised who looked at the effects of this fungus on the bore frog. And with Dion's help, we, Tom was able to show that. So, so um, frog species are, are on kind of a spectrum of how they respond to infection with chytrid fungus. And at one end of the spectrum, you've got things like Crinia signifera that seems to be able to get infected and survive just fine and become a carrier of the fungus and, and therefore problematic. At the other end of the spectrum are things like bore frogs. They get one sniff of this fungus and they, they keel over dead. And Tom demonstrated that very well. Um, so honestly, chief amongst the preventable threats is probably this one. Um, it's no surprise to anybody. It's habitat loss and degradation. And by degradation, I mean all the things we do to habitats short of outright destroying them. We carve them up with roads and freeways. We, we, we let weeds grow. We do all sorts of horrible stuff to the land. Um, I want to, so this, this here is, uh, I've been watching, you know, I, I work on reptiles in the Alps amongst other places and, and alpine tree frogs, which we have here on the right. Um, and we've been watching some really horrendous um, habitat destruction taking place at the Mount Hotham Alpine Resort over the last uh, 15 years or so, and obviously it happened long before I started working up there. Um, but, you know, Hotham's a really interesting place because it's, it, it, it's a series of very narrow, high elevation spurs. It's not big, flat, open plains like the Bogan High Plains just over the ditch. So there's not much there already, and it's already been carved up historically with lodges and car parks and roads and things, and they just keep doing it. They just keep doing it over and over and over. They just keep bulldozing Hotham. So Hotham is a real hot spot for this kind of damage. So one of the points I want to make about frog habitat and conserving frog habitat is that we usually think and agencies are obsessed with frog breeding habitat. And it's, it's actually often not that hard to say, protect the water, right? Like that's where the frogs breed, you need to look after it. But for almost all of our frogs, we're only just beginning to learn how much non-breeding habitat they use, how much terrestrial dry stuff they require. Some, it's probably kilometers and kilometers and hectares and hectares like giant burrowing frogs and so on. Some maybe a little bit less, but for almost all species, they need the land as well. And it's very, very hard to protect it because it's not on people's, you know, agencies don't think about the terrestrial stuff. You think of frogs, you think of water. Well, we need to be thinking of the land as well. And the other problem is, is that we really don't understand frogs' use of terrestrial habitats all that well. When Renee Catullo was doing her work on the Euparolia, I mentioned Renee earlier, Renee started putting pitfall traps out from ponds in East Gippsland and seeing how far those little tiny Euparolia frogs were moving away from the water. And it's kilometres. Like these things move really, they, they need a lot of terrestrial real estate. And so you, you destroy that land, they're in trouble. But also you stick a highway through that land or a car park and you're creating barriers, you're creating, you're dividing populations up into subpopulations. This stuff really matters. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about this in a minute about um, some of the delusional mitigation garbage that 
Uh, we've got to deal with daily that, that um, wastes way too much of my time and causes me a lot of stress. I want to also talk about, uh, well, I don't want to talk about it, I'm going to, I'm going to touch on um, surveys. You know, a lot of the time, whether it's logging, whether it's building a housing estate or other kind of development, um, pre-impact surveys are conducted. There's a whole lot of people who are involved in this. They go out, they do surveys. There are guidelines on how much, and, and a lot of those guidelines are just, they're just best guesses by people who, who you know, kind of really wouldn't know. Um, if you find the frog when you do a survey, that's good, right? You know you've got your frog, you know it's there, you can make your recommendation, you can do all about it. But what do you do when you don't detect the frog? Um, we know that some of these frogs, like the giant burrowing frog I work on, we know that you can go to a place where that frog was recorded last year. You can go to the exact spot. You can go do surveys. You can go there night after night. You can have your headlamp on and you can listen and you can spotlight, you can dip net. You can put your call recorders up and you can listen. You can wait for the right weather. And you won't record the frog. You won't record it. You won't record it. You won't record it. And then five years later, they record another one. Now that frog was there the whole time. Some of these things are just really bloody hard to detect. No pre-impact survey is going to last for five years, right? So you send people out, they don't detect it. They come back and they tell their bosses we didn't detect it. They go, oh, you put in a lot of hard work there over that week. What the hell, we'll bulldoze it, right? They're not there. It's rubbish, right? So you need the right people who understand this issue to be interpreting pre-impact surveys. Um, there is a very, very poor understanding of this connectivity in infrequently used habitat. We know that a hell of a lot of frogs occur in patches and genetics tells us that sometimes there is exchange between those patches. But some of that habitat where those exchanges take place, the frogs aren't in there very often. These are really probably infrequent dispersal events. But if you lose that habitat, if you block that off, if you build a car park, then all of a sudden you don't have that connectivity and that genetic connectivity goes out the door. And modern genetics tells us that's a real problem, right? So again, we need to be very, very careful about what we're interpreting as as habitat or not habitat, or some of the consultants that frustrate me the most who use terms like low quality habitat, uh, you know, because they think it's infrequent. Well, you know, infrequently used doesn't mean it's low quality, it just means it's infrequently used. It might be absolutely vital for the kind of connectivity we're talking about here. Um, and land tenure, I mean, increasingly, you know, we, we, we started off, uh, you know, the, 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 the colonial way is that we destroyed a lot of land, but we reserved some in national parks and, and other kinds of parks, and they were meant to be the ark that protected things. Um, we're finding that sometimes uh, that's not enough. Sometimes the land management in those parks is bad news for certain species. So we can't ignore private land. Some of the best habitat restoration that's going on is happening on private land. Um, and some of the things that aren't happening on private land but are happening on public land, like some of the fire regimes, mean that private land is increasingly important for conservation. So we don't want to write that off. <coughs> um, okay, so big news this year was the announcement that uh, logging of native forest was going to stop. This really matters for things like the southern giant burrowing frog that I'm working on, Latoria Watts and I, uh, that Dion and co are working on. Good news, but there's a big asterisk on that, that good news. Um, so first of all, we need to understand that we're coming from a shifted baseline. What is out there now that we've stopped logging is very, very different to what it looked like 200 years ago, okay? A lot of it has been cleared, a lot of it has been logged, sometimes repeatedly. Um, we know um, in recent years we've seen unequivocally that climate change is bringing us higher frequency of fires, higher severity of fires um, and, and more spread. You know, the Black Summer fires were enormous and after those fires, um, some animals, including frogs, struggle. We know from some great work that was done by colleagues out of King Lake um, after the Black Saturday fires, you know, there was a really neat study done where, where Dominique Potvin was looking at the Latoria Ewing complex um, and so she was doing genetic work, fortunately, and then the Black Saturday fires came through King Lake and burnt her old study area. So naturally, she's really worried about her frogs. When it was safe to do so, she goes back in. And after a little bit of time, Dominique starts seeing that, <clears throat> that there's lots of frogs again. You can hear them. You can see them. There's tadpoles. There's eggs. Okay, the agencies love that stuff. Nature healing itself, right? It's all good. Nature bouncing back from fires. Dominique looked at the genetics after the fires, and what the genetics showed is that those frogs that were there were based on very, very, very few founding females. It was a genetic bottleneck, okay? So you only needed a couple of survivors. Frogs, such as the Ewing complex, have lots of eggs, so they can rapidly look like things are okay again, but genetically they're really, really bottlenecks. So we can't just look 
at a fire and then when we see the green sprouts and hear the frogs calling again say nature is healed because it's not okay so when when we've got the the, the climate risk mounting um, just because things superficially might look like they're okay it's not always the case and that's important um, of course there are other threats out there as i said so um, Logging may have stopped in a lot of areas, but we've still got chytrid fungus, we've still got climate change. Giant burrowing frogs breed in streams that you can step over. Okay, those streams dry up in a heartbeat into little pools and those pools dry up. The frogs probably live a few years um, and they, so they can cope with a year or two without breeding. But if you get droughts that, like we had in the millennium drought that are 10, 12 years long, that's probably too much, okay? So sooner or later, we're gonna hit thresholds with these things and start losing them. And also, not all logging has stopped. So we're working on a threatened lizard in Wombat State Forest and there were three kinds of logging going on in Wombat. There was your traditional Vic Forest logging coop stuff. There was cleanup of storm damage. So the 2021 big storm that went through, Vic Forest is saying we need to go and cut up all that timber that fell because it's messy and a fire hazard or whatever. Um, I'd, I'd debate that. But, and also um, there are traditional owner groups um, who are allowed to extract resources from the land and they are using Vic Forest to cut logs out of Wombat State Forest. So that kind of logging has not been banned, it will continue. So we need to be aware of that. Um, now I already spoke about this. I mean, I think we all understand that this is a big deal. Anyone who doesn't, um, you know, I can argue with you later about that, but um, we need to understand how species cope with, um, with the kind of extreme weather we're getting now. We're, we're probably heading into another El Nino now, so it's likely to get hot and dry again. Um, and that can be enough for species that have been pushed to the brink by disease or other things, this can be enough to tip them over the edge. We need to be aware of that. Um, there's some really lovely work going on. And again, colleagues here um, are at the forefront of that, looking at uh, this, this brave new world of gene mixing, of saying, all right, if you've got isolated populations, if you mix them up, you often end up with a more robust animal that maybe can cope with climate better than it can. There are climate translocations, should we move animals into areas that are, are gonna be better a decade, five decades from now than they are right now. So there's work going on in that space. Again, as I said, this is one of those big wicked threats. And so the way to get species to cope with that is to take our foot off their throat on things like logging, habitat destruction and so on. Um, we can do a little bit of, of small scale manipulation of things like water permanence in some cases, but that's not the answer to the, the bigger problems, right? That, that's real critical care kind of stuff. Um, and firefighting chemicals, which I'll touch on again a, a little bit more. Um, we know surprisingly little about firefighting chems, which I'll talk about a bit. So um, invasive vertebrate species. Now, um, the chytrid fungus is an invasive species. It, it, it's bad news, but it's not a vertebrate, right? So now I'm talking about the animals with backbones that are causing problems for our frogs. Most of us are aware, I think, that deer have gone up exponentially uh, in numbers since the Black Saturday fires a bit over a decade ago. The damage you see out there is enormous. When we put trail cameras out there to see what's going on in the landscape, you get lots and lots and lots and lots of deer. Okay, so deer are a real problem. And they, they tend to mess up um, frog breeding habitats. Some generalist species probably don't mind so much. Um, some species that have very specialized habitat requirements probably do mind. Um, but also there's a, there's a very real chance that deer may be a vector for the chytrid fungus. So you've got a big mobile animal that gets its legs muddy in one spot and it hops over the ridge into the next catchment. Maybe they're spreading it and Dion again has been involved in, in research looking into that. Um, uh, there, there, people will ask about fencing, you know, can you just put a fence around that bog system in the Alps and keep the deer out? It, it's not a long-term solution. It comes with its own problems. It can only be done in certain areas. So again, it, 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 it may be appropriate in very, very small places locally, but not really on a big scale. Um, and this one that I've lost a lot of bark over on social media over the years, bloody horses. Um, anyone, anyone who still thinks that they can argue with me about whether that is good for frog habitat, Talk to me afterwards, you know, like seriously. I'm happy to take you on on that. Again, potentially vectors of the chytrid fungus, but these guys cause damage. And sometimes in some areas in the Alps, the damage is bloody staggering. Like this is what it can look like. It's a picture from the Victorian Alps from my colleague, uh, ARI, or ex-ARI botanist Arne Tolson, he's retired now, but this is horse damage up there. Remember that some of these areas were grazed for sheep in the old days and cattle uh, until a, a decade or two back. So these are areas that have really been kicked around. The last thing they need are horses and the numbers of horses, I've been working in the Alps now for about two decades and in that time alone, the numbers of horses would blow your mind. And horses are an eminently solvable problem, right? Like seriously, 
a helicopter gunship, a good budget in a few years, and we would not be needing to even talk about horses, right? It, it, it's a solvable problem. Um, and these are some of the frog species that are affected by it. So critically endangered alpine tree frog up the top and a, and a remarkably coloured, um, should offer any dendii um, photograph from Peter Robertson down the bottom. Those are things that are affected by horses in the Alps. And then there's this other vertebrate, invasive vertebrate. It's one that we breed and we stock. And it still kind of does my head in a little bit that we know that, uh, that trout, redfin, carp eat tadpoles, they eat eggs, they probably eat a few frogs, and yet we breed them, we stock them, we spread them around. Uh, it's kind of nuts, but we do, right? So there's some, some nice research. Graham Gillespie did some work in the early 2000s on the impacts of, uh, of trout on spotted tree frogs. Matt West has continued that work um, and is doing some amazing work at the moment. And Matt's been out there with the Electra Fisher with a whole bunch of my XARI colleagues removing trout from streams to see if that um, see if that generates a really good reaction with the spotted tree frogs. The results are promising, but you know it's hard work to get all those trout out and they come back again at times. And of course, Dave Hunter's done similar work uh, on the impacts of fish on Boorolong frogs in New South Wales. So we've got, we've got really good information, right? This is not something that we're guessing at. We know this very, very well. Uh, chemicals. So um, this is the one that, that, that most of the public think of when they think about what's uh, happening to frogs. It's, you know, we, we've polluted the waterways and frogs have uh, uh, this kind of oxygen and, and water transfer through their skin. So chemicals, and it's true, right? Like you don't want... Um, you don't want too many nasty chemicals in waterways. Um, but we also discovered a couple of decades ago that um, w where we thought this might have been the smoking gun for a lot of the frog declines, then it turned out that um, a lot of the worst declines were happening in the most pristine areas that didn't really have so many chemicals. And then in the areas where the chemicals were, some of the frogs were doing just fine. So it was more than just this, but that's not to say the chemicals aren't a problem. There's a surprisingly small amount of work being done on this. There are some really smart people, including some of my colleagues here, Laura Grogan, Claire Morrison, Chantelle Langcott from Queensland, and I'm collaborating with them a little bit on um, looking at firefighting chemicals and how they affect frogs and tatties and eggs. So, uh, so we're, we're going to be looking at a number of species and again, comparing uh, frogs that breed in flowing water in streams with, with still water in ponds and so on to see how they are affected by the sort of chemicals we dump across landscapes during big fires. Uh, and so they're the kinds of things we want to research as we do that. Um, okay, and now the one that um, gets me in the most fights. Uh, something that I've identified as a very significant threat to most threatened species in the state is some of the ways we kid ourselves about the impacts we're having and the ways that we do or don't affect those impacts and those sort of mitigations. So um, this, this is tied very, very closely with that earlier threat I spoke about with, in terms of habitat destruction and degradation, right? So uh, a lot of that's going on. These days, people are watching, so when threatened species are involved or likely to be involved, there's a whole cottage industry of consultants who go out there and try and assess what impacts might be and who recommend mitigations on how we might sort of uh, back off on some of those threats. Now, um, one of the things that shocks me is that the evidence of mitigations working versus failing um, We've, we've now decades and decades of doing this. We've got a pretty good idea of what works and what doesn't. And most of it doesn't, yet we keep doing it. So it's kind of a little bit problematic in that sense. There is a real issue with, um, there are people and companies out there who uh, make real money out of habitat destruction and they've learned to pick their advisors very, very carefully. They know that if you get the right person, you'll get the right advice. Um, the people who do that work also know that if you say no to a client and say, no, 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 that, that habitat must be protected, you're probably not going to get a whole lot more work uh, if that's what you keep saying, because you're bad for business. Um, and I've personally been subjected to some pretty nasty tactics in terms of silencing reasonable critique of this stuff. Now, my view is if you're in the business of providing advice that will lead to habitat destruction, you're, uh, you, you know, you're, you're up for critical review, but others have a very different view about that. So what can we do about it? Um, I think that any advice that says it's okay to destroy habitat if you do A, B and C to mitigate it, it should be up for peer review, but not just any peers, because there is a very real risk here of companies, you know, having a, you know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours uh, approach to peer review. We don't want that. We want genuine independent peer review. If someone proposes a mitigation, if someone says, 
you put a tunnel under that road, the frogs will go under the tunnel, connectivity is maintained despite the freeway. If someone says, we'll build some habitat down the road and we'll pick the frogs up and move them there, then that advice should come with an honest review of how that has panned out on previous occasions it's been tried. And it very, very, very rarely does, right? So um, if someone says we're gonna, we're gonna relocate the frogs, you say, okay, tell me the track record of relocate, growing grass frogs, happens all the time, right? It's a really popular one for saying, we'll just move them down the road. Okay, well tell me how many times growing grass frog relocations have worked in the past. I've personally assessed them, I've written reports on this where they failed and they failed and they failed and they failed and yet we keep kind of doing it. Um, one, Michael Scroggy at ARI likes to say, how about these people have to put up security bonds? If you're so sure that your advice is gonna work to save that population, put up a $10 million security bond. If the frogs are still there in 15 years, all good. If they're not, you forfeit your 10 mil. You know, let's see how courage of convictions at that point when we raise the stakes in that sort of way. Um, certainly, we need to stop bypassing the most knowledgeable experts. Um, and we need to raise the ecological literacy of both the consultants involved and their clients. Now, offsets. Um, this is still used. I was dealing with this this week. Now, um, anyone who is involved in this stuff should know what the literature says about offsetting. There's a lot of literature. This is a big body of work and it is unidirectional. The messages in the published literature on offsets, anytime it's been assessed, the papers and the, 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 the titles of the papers get more and more and more strident as you go on with this, okay? There's, it, I'm staggered that, that we're still uh, pursuing this when these are, the kinds of, um, these are the kinds of papers that are showing it. Now, when it comes to cherry picking your experts, in 2003, I wrote, it's pretty blurry here, sorry, that's, that's not a good pick. I wrote, this is the National Recovery Plan for um, what the feds decided they would call the southern bell frog, what I call the growling grass frog, and I lost that battle about what we're going to call it in this document. But I wrote the National Recovery Plan in 2003. It took, it bounced between Melbourne and Canberra for nine years before it was published in 2012. Um, so in doing that, I formed a recovery team in the early 2000s. Uh, Peter Robertson was on the recovery team, Jeff Hurd, Murray Littlejohn, uh, Mike Scroggy, all the right people were on there. Now, 2012, this plan came out. It, it was the blueprint for how you meant to manage growling grass frogs. About the same time, the Victorian government was uh, developing the Melbourne Strategic Assessment to work out how to manage threatened species in an urbanising landscape. So, you would think, as my employer, the person who's written the recovery plan and the recovery team around that recovery plan would be your ideal advisors on how to manage growling grass frogs in urbanising landscapes. But no. No, instead they went to consulting companies and got the, the blueprints for how the frogs were going to be managed in those landscapes done by someone else. We didn't know. We didn't know this thing existed until it appeared, right? So, again, this is cherry picking your experts because you know if you go to the best people, you won't get an answer that's going to make your life easy. Now, here's a question. A question around growling grass frogs that illustrates some of these problems, right? Um, what's the larval phase? How long do growling grass frog tadpoles? stay in the water between hatching from an egg to turning into a little metamorph frog, how long does that take? Now, I was subjected some years ago to a report that said there was a water body uh, that the consultants said, it's okay to bulldoze it because that water body dries up for two, three months a year, right? And they had a paper, they were waving a paper that said the larval phase for growling grass frog was 15 months. So if this water body dried up for a couple of months a year, no way could it be growling grass frog breeding habitat. No way, right? Because they would dry up and they would die. Turns out that at one spot in Tasmania, the larval phase for growling grass frogs might be 15 months. You talk to Jeff Hurd and you ask Jeff Hurd about the larval phase for growling grass frogs in Victoria, they can be in and out in three or four months. So these are the kinds of claims that are being made to justify habitat destruction and they're rubbish. They really are, and this is why we need competent review of these sorts of claims, or we're just gonna keep losing this habitat hand over fist. So here's a little thought experiment. Here's a surgeon. We can't show his face on TV, but we'll call him Rob, right? So Rob the surgeon has developed a fabulous new surgical technique, he loves it, right? And it makes him a lot of money. So Rob is going, Rob's going hammer and tong with his new surgical technique, and he's making really, really good money over it. The only problem, is that 
98% of Rob's patients die on the operating table. Now, if that happened, you tell me how much longer a surgeon would be allowed to continue using that method. So my question here is very, very, very few other sectors would allow this idea of really uh, dubious, consistently failing mitigations that justify habitat destruction. There's almost no other industry that would allow that, but we do. Um, so here's an example. Um, this is a paper that was published um, in 2014. Uh, it was about a population of growling grass frogs that was to be bulldozed and ultimately was bulldozed. And so to mitigate that destruction, new ponds were dug, there was a new road put in and there was a triple underpass put under the road to try and save these frogs. Ponds on either side of the road. And this paper uh, heralds the first documented case of growling grass frogs travelling under a road using these underpasses, right? All looks good. The only problem is this paper appeared in 2014. In 2013, the people running this knew that that population was crashing to the floor, right? So they published this paper saying uh, this underpass is going great in full knowledge that that population was crashing to extinction. They followed up with another publication where they said, look, big surprise everybody, the, the, the whole thing ended up failing despite our wonderful underpass and that's what happened with the frogs. And this is the sort of language they used. Now, this is really, this, this really upsets me, right? This is disingenuous. So they're suggesting that translocation is occasionally used. That's not true, it's not occasionally used. It was used all the time, especially back then, but it still is, right? Not occasional. It's not used as a last resort, it's used all the time. Um, they describe the work as unavoidable loss of habitat. Well, it's not unavoidable, like they bulldozed it, right? Like it's avoidable. Um, they described it as experimental. It wasn't an experiment. They were destroying a known population of a, of a federally listed threatened species, right? So all of this kind of language and saying, shit, we were really surprised that, that this didn't work. Um, if, if they continue to fail like this, maybe we should reconsider this as a conservation strategy. Maybe we should even, here's it, here's, maybe we could even consider not destroying the habitat. Like these people are coming out and preaching this knowing full well what they've done. Now, how could they have possibly known what was gonna happen when they relocated those frogs? Is there any way they could have foreseen this? Well, they could have looked at the literature. There is again, for decades now, we've had this growing body of literature in the peer reviewed publications that tell us that this idea of ad hoc moving stuff down the road because it's inconveniently positioned where we wanna build something fails. You move it, they don't stick, you lose it. The population is doomed whether you move them or you don't and they may well be causing problems at the release site. So um, in fact, um, with a couple of colleagues, so I'm on the Victorian Translocation Evaluation Panel, we assess every proposal to, to move threatened species in the state. My colleagues, Peter Menkhorst, recently retired from the Arthur Isler Institute, Joe Sumner from Museums of Victoria, published a review on this after some Western Australian consultants published a paper talking about how they had translocated 20,000 vertebrate species from a development site. And they were proclaiming this as a great victory. We saved all these species and moved them down the road. So anyway, Pete and Joe and I sort of had a, a bit of an issue with that. But the other way that the consultants might have known that it was gonna fail is by reading the goddamn National Recovery Plan that we published a year or two earlier that said that it did, it did the hard work for them. It did the review and said most of these attempts fail. It's not worth doing. Okay, so that was 10 years ago. Presumably we've all learned our lessons now. We save habitat, we don't destroy it anymore, right? Um, sadly, no. Again, Mount Hotham, we, I've been working up there for two decades. We see this all the time. We come up on a Monday, we, we load our four-wheel drive up, we drive all the way up from Melbourne, we get up there and we arrive and sometimes this is what we find. We find the bulldozers going through the habitat. This is Alpine tree frog habitat. It's, it, it's incremental loss. Every year we go up there, there's a bit more and a bit more and a bit more and a bit more. And sadly, uh, this area just here and over to the side is also where I've got 18-year-old um, long-term monitoring sites for critically endangered lizards, and they bulldozed all that lizard habitat as well. And at the time, everybody involved knew about my work. They'd all been on site with me. The resort people, the government planners, the consultants all knew about it. And my phone didn't ring once to say what's the impact of this sort of habitat. So no, we haven't learned, we're still doing it. <clears throat> um, and then there's the non-threatened species that we're moving around the state. Now, I mentioned earlier about Crinia signifera being uh, a species that carries this fungus with them. Um, so we uh, published this work led by Laura Branley a few years ago that showed that Crinia catches the fungus, they don't die, they carry heavy loads of the fungus and Crinia occurs in really, really, really high numbers. So what that means is if you're a species like ball ball frog, 
that is susceptible to this fungus or alpine tree frog, co-occurring with crinia is probably bad news. Yet as we bulldoze more and more habitat through Victoria, we get consultants picking up literally hundreds to thousands of crinia, moving them down the road. So where are they dumping them? Growling grass frog sites, southern toadlet sites, other threatened species, you know, we're worsening this problem on a daily basis. And essentially what we are doing is outsourcing critical wildlife management decisions to people who are making money out of the habitat destruction. Um, so to sum this up, I've had my rant again. Uh, wishful thinking does not equal sound conservation management. Um, I'm gonna strongly suggest, and I do this all the time, that if you're in the business of providing advice that can or will lead to habitat destruction, you better be damn sure about what you're saying, right? Like you really want to be sure what you're saying because the consequences of getting it wrong, which we do all the time, are very, very high. Um, you need to justify your advice based on, uh, on, on prior success. And there's almost none of that. So I don't know how these, these uh, suggestions keep getting up. Um, and maybe there should be some consequences if your proposed mitigation fails. Again, quoting my, my colleague Mike Scroggy, Scroggy says, uh, you know, imagine a scenario where you're an engineer and you design a bridge over a ravine and the very first school bus full of school kids, it goes over that bridge, that bridge collapses and the, the kids all fall into the ravine and are gone. You know, you go to jail for that. Yet, you know, we, we have this industry where you can make this advice and we can go out, you know, we can go for a drive on the weekend and go to all these areas where things were translocated and see if they're still there. And in most cases, they're not. And no one's responsible for it. Um, all right, next threat. Um, this is the last one. And I'm grateful here to Matt West. I want to shout out to Matt West. I didn't think of including this originally in the book. This is the last thread I'm going to go through. Um, and I'm really glad Matt brought this up because it's dead right. Okay, so we're, we're in the social media age and there is a degree of competitiveness there. And it's, it's in some ways a very good thing. If you look, go on Instagram, Facebook now and look at the sort of photographs that your average young person is producing and putting online, they are bloody magnificent, right? They are National Geographic level photographs, right? Um, we've got my colleague Matt Clancy in the room. Matt's photographs are stunning. Um, Matt's a really valued member of our team. Now Matt takes beautiful photos. So they're really, really good. But the problem is some of the practices that are going on by the people who want the photos, the competitiveness between people who say, I want a picky of what you got a picky of, the people who want images of the rarest and uh, uh, rarest species out there and what they'll do to get those images. Now this is another photograph from Angus Martins from back in the day when ball frogs were, were pretty common in, in the small area where they occurred. And this is a nest with eggs. Uh, ball, ball frogs produce the biggest eggs of any frog in the state. Now, um, a few years ago, Dion was out doing field work um, at Bor Bor. He was some considerable distance in through some really hard country uh, in the middle of nowhere. And he bumped into a, a young guy there with a backpack and uh, asked him what he was doing. And the answer was that he was digging up nests of ball, ball frogs to photograph the eggs. And so that's bad enough, right? Well, that's not a good thing, right? But the problem is that there's every single chance that he'll then go back maybe with GPS coordinates, tell his mates, here's where I photograph those eggs, your turn, off you go, go out and do it. So when we think about people who go and watch wildlife and photograph wildlife, if you're into birds or you're into mammals, normally you do it with a lens that long and you do it with binoculars. When it comes to herps, people want to catch them and they want to pose them, they want to dig them up, they're potentially spreading chytrid fungus on their feet and their shoes and whatever. And they're, they're digging up burrows, they're disturbing habitat, they're ripping up logs. Um, the old let's go herping and peel up logs is, is bad news, right? Like we know now that, that once you've ripped up and disturbed something, even if you put it back carefully, that habitat is really damaged and it's really, really problematic. So as the human population grows, this is gonna be a, a worse and worse and worse problem if we don't stamp on it now. There are um, enforcement people who are very, very interested in this issue and are looking at it very, very carefully. So, um, you know, and, and I, I don't think anybody wants to have to make examples of people, but that's kind of what it's getting to, just so the message gets out there. Um, so essentially we need to get uh, uh, an ethos across to people that particularly now, we don't have the luxury of having our passions being more important than this, these species, right? Like, you know, it, it may be that you never get the chance to photograph a ball ball frog yourself. That's just, that's just how things are, right? Sometimes that's, that's the cost of how threatened we've made these things. Um, and another, just another concept, I'm getting close to winding up here. Um, another concept that um, people don't seem to understand um, a lot of people, and unfortunately a lot of people in decision-making positions in agencies, um, 
they kind of think of they, they think of decline and extinction as a as a dichotomy, right? Like if it's not gone yet, it's probably okay. But as we increasingly know with our conservation programs, as a species declines from comparatively widespread to fragmented to fewer and fewer populations, as those declines happen, genetic diversity declines with it and we end up with fewer animals with much, with much less genetic diversity and it becomes exponentially harder and less probable and more expensive to save those species once we're at that end of that decline, right? So the hard part is, is that when we're, when we're at some distance from that, it's very, very hard to argue for habitat preservation. Oh, it's still relatively common, doesn't matter if we bulldoze a bit more. It's, it's only listed at a state level, it's not listed at a federal level, bulldoze a bit more. It's only endangered, it's not critically endangered yet, bulldoze a bit more. You know, by the time we get to that razor's edge of critically endangered, it's really expensive. It's, tax, it's often taxpayer dollars. It's our money that's, that's having to go to that. And the chances of success are much, much, much lower than if we dealt with it earlier. So prevention uh, is far better than cure. Um, so uh, a bit of a shout out now. I'm on secondment to Zoos Victoria. They've um, welcomed me with open arms and I'm very, very grateful um, for the opportunities I've been given working with some wonderful people, including Dion. Um, down here we have uh, um, Damien Goodall. Um, this is Damien Goodall's photo. Um, Damo does amazing work on the captive frogs at Melbourne Zoo, as do a bunch of other people. So uh, Raylene Donnelly and others are doing en enormously good work. Um, we're very fortunate tonight to have uh, Mike McFadden from Taronga Zoo here. So um, the Sydney Zoo is represented as well. Of course, there's Jerry Marantelli's Amphibian Research Centre. Really dedicated people. And I can't stress strongly enough how important it is these days to have holistic conservation programs, right? We've got the field programs I've been doing forever and a day, and now I'm working with people like, like Damo, and, and we've got that captive component, and it makes our conservation programs so much stronger, like really, really makes a huge difference. So when you combine field-based research, survey, monitoring, conservation work with captive conservation breeding with genetics programs, it's as good as we can do it at this stage, right? It's really powerful kind of stuff. <clears throat> um, so here are a couple of heroes I've been talking about tonight. Um, beautiful photo by the late Michael Williams of Westie doing his thing, spotted tree frog streams. Um, Dion there doing his, uh, doing his COVID, uh, COVID thing with the bore frogs. Uh, you can see this, this little frog here has got a little radio transmitter on it. So these guys are doing really good work. They're, it's like some of the areas they're doing it in is tough country, you know, like Borbor's hard country to work in. These guys are away from home and from family for very, very long periods. Dion's got a couple of wonderful lads, wonderful kids that I like very, very much. And, and you know, th those kids pay the sacrifice of having dad away as well. I'm sure, um, I'm sure Sally will tell us, you know, how often Peter's been away over the years doing field work. So there are a lot of people putting in a lot of hard work and a lot of sacrifice here to, to run these conservation programs and we really should be grateful for them. Um, and I just want to note here that um, a, a problem that seems uh, um, inherent in these kinds of publications, this kind of book, is that between the time that I submitted the final manuscript to CSIRO Publishing um, for the book to be published, the taxonomists were working overtime and so I managed in that time to get squeeze in the change where Latoria dentata became Latoria quiritatus. We got that one sorted. Um, there was another one, um, uh, Mixophys, uh, not Mixophys, um, Helioporus, uh, the giant burrowing frog got split into subspecies. The two that I didn't capture, I ran out of time, um, the book was too far advanced, are uh, the changes in taxonomy for these two. So this is that uh, the, the Mixophys I spoke about earlier, the, the southern barred frog or stuttering frog. So it's no longer Mixophys balbus as it's been known forever and a day here. It's now Mixophys australis is what was once known in Victoria. Now, hasn't been recorded in Victoria since I think it's 1982. So there is a very real chance that we've lost it completely from the state and it's not doing too well over the border either. So this is one that, that we may not have for much longer in Australia. And of course, ground grass frogs split into subspecies. So, um, uh, and both subspecies occur in Victoria, right? So we've got uh, what is now Latoria raniformis raniformis and Latoria raniformis major. Um, so they weren't captured in this book. That taxonomy is not in there, but you know, maybe, uh, maybe some other time. Um, okay, so take homes uh, from tonight. Hopefully the book has um, you know, enough information for you to tell one frog from another um, and figure out what they are. Hopefully you can learn a little bit about the remarkable people who gave us the gift of the knowledge that I've compiled into this book.
uh, Murray Little, John Angus Martin, Peter Rawlinson, Graham Watson, Peter Robertson. These people have done amazing amounts of work and we should all be very, very grateful for what they've gifted to us. Um, I've banged on and on, as I do every single time I get the opportunity about threats and declines and what we should do about it. Half of our frogs are threatened. That's not good, right? That's bullshit. We need to stop that. We need to do something about it. We're at a point now where we, we can't muck around with this anymore and we can't keep being polite about it, right? We, we need, to, need to rattle some cages. Um, I'm hoping that in here I've given pretty clear directions for the sort of things we need to do, right? No, no longer really needs to keep debating this or guessing, right? The information's there. The experts are dotted around this room. You know, if you want to know how to save frogs, get the right people and listen to them. Um, and we must be really honest about the mitigations and about the causes of these declines because we're kidding ourselves too often and that kidding ourselves is one of the major drivers of those declines. Um, now, most of you have hopefully seen recently very, very exciting news of a lizard being rediscovered in Victoria after 54 odd years, I think it is, on the missing list. Um, hugely significant um, for a whole bunch of reasons, um, not the least of which um, you know, this, is a, this was a reprieve on a habit, like grassland ecosystems, we have cleared those, to, I, I think it's 99%, it's something bloody close to that, right? So there ain't much left. And we thought this thing was gone, it's not. It doesn't mean it won't be gone soon because, you know, we're gonna need multiple populations to save this thing in the decades to come. And we're still clearing it at such a rate of knots that I don't know that we're gonna have enough suitable real estate to do that. So this lizard, and this is a lizard that again, I keep talking about Peter Robertson. Peter, Peter, I, I can't imagine how many miles he's done driving home from looking for this thing with, in a depressed state. And I've done some of those miles with Pete and we've gone out and we've looked and looked and looked and driven home and not found any. And he's done a lot more miles without me, right? So the, the, the rediscovery is great. It, it, it comes on the back of a hell of a lot of bloody hard work, but it's sobering lessons about what will happen. Now, we thought it was gone. It's not. We're hoping like hell that this thing is not gone. It may be, but Zoos Vic are gonna have one last crack. We're gonna go out and try again to try and find it. We, you know, if you're a betting man, you wouldn't wanna put money on us finding because a lot of people have tried um, without any luck. But these are sobering lessons to say that we've hit that line in the sand. We've stepped well over it, right? Like we can't keep shifting it further and further because these things are now legitimately being lost. They're missing. Um, I want to do a shout out now to two people who couldn't be with us tonight, but Phoebe Burns and Zach Atkins, a lot of you know these guys. Um, I, I actually had some, some pretty dark days writing this book, like I had to do it, I couldn't do it during work hours, and some of the times I was doing it I was getting a pretty hard time from some people and it was, uh, it was a bit of a struggle for me, I, I had some real mental health challenges. and. These guys, along with people like Peter and Angus, had my back, and I'm, I, um, I will eternally be grateful for that. So I just want to shout out for Zach and Phoebes. <coughs> um, and that's me done. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs>